So um, there's really kind of two parts to this talk today. Um, the first half will focus on El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, and I sort of ask this provoking question, is it solved? And uh, of course, coming from the Climate Prediction Center, I can say uh, it certainly is not. But there is a perception, especially after the 97-98 El Nino event, that the climate community has really nailed ENSO down. I mean, they were able to see El Nino coming, so that they must must really have El Nino and La Nina in their back pocket. And I would argue that there is still a lot of development work to do here. Um, the second half of my talk will be on the Madden Julian Oscillation, or MJO, and I'm focusing here on the attribution and prediction component as well. So this is uh, really basic. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. I know you guys have these slides online. So a lot of these uh, uh, slides I'm probably going to rip through a little too uh, fast for your taste, but feel free to uh, ask me questions so we can go back and, and I can explain them further. But El Nino, of course, is the warm phase of the ENSO cycle. La Nina is the cold phase of the ENSO cycle. Here is showing sea surface temperatures for two um, periods, uh, the 97-98 event, then 89 um, here. And, um, and of course, there's this warming across the eastern Pacific and cooling um, as well for the La Nina cycle. And this occurs every about two to seven years. And while I'm showing ocean temperatures, you should know that there's a very large scale circulation and rainfall change that occurs over the tropical Pacific as well. So we look at both components in order to determine the state of ENSO. Uh, they last about nine to 12 months. La Nina can persist for multiple years. And the peak in strength is generally during the Northern Hemisphere winter. And um, at Climate Prediction Center, we monitor El Nino and La Nina using this region, the Nina 3.4 region in uh, the East Central Equatorial Pacific. And if you average sea surface temperatures in that box, you get a time series, which is shown at the bottom. And that gives you your El Nino and La Nina episodes. So uh, we have uh, at Climate Prediction Center uh, several products, one that is weekly, which is released every Monday. And then we also have monthly monitoring prediction products. Um, this monthly product is called the ENSO Diagnosis Discussion. If you want to join the email list, you can send an email to the bottom. And in this diagnosis discussion, we update the status of ENSO. We also offer predictions associated with it. And we um, have also, in recent years, started uh, issuing watches and advisories in association with El Nino and La Nina. And basically, it's a team of seven CPC forecasters on one of them, and also um, some folks at the IRI who uh, sit down. And we consider several aspects of the climate system. One is just the observed state. The other, and so these are the various uh, variables of ocean and atmosphere. And then we also consider, of course, a huge suite of um, models, both dynamical, which are run on the supercomputers, and statistical models and then the multi-model combinations of them. And we also uh, consider our own experience with uh, previous ENSO episodes. Michelle, this clarification, the IRI, mm -hmm. who are they? Um, oh, can I go? Uh, yeah, so um, the IRI is the International Research uh, Institute for Climate and Society. And um, they are in Colombia. And they um, have a seasonal prediction component to their work. It's international, whereas we focus on the United States. And Tony Barnson has been the chief forecaster there and is an ENSO expert and has been for many, many decades. So he brings a lot of value to the team. And, um, sorry. Uh, are you taking questions? Well, uh, we'd like to hold them off unless they're really quick. But you, you, you I, I, well, I, 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 mine was critical. <laughs> yeah, I understand what happened there. Okay. So, <laughs> Uh, so basically, the forecasters, there's a team of us, and certainly we talk to each other, but ultimately the probabilities we create are done individually. So everyone has their favorite products to look at and models, and they sit down, they fill out a spreadsheet and of probabilities in the coming like eight seasons, and we create a consensus uh, product by averaging together all those probabilities. This is the most recent one released in early April, and you can see that we uh, dominantly uh, favor neutral. Um, and then uh, as you get into next winter, uh, it laps really closer to uh, climatology. So we're really not sure what's going to happen next winter. So how well do these ENSO predictions work? Well, really well when you see the 97-98 El Nino six months in advance. That basically spawns the cottage, in, in, uh, cottage industry of 
of parodies like Chris Farley enacting El Nino on the Weather Channel. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to figure out a way to embed video into this, but if you go to YouTube and Google Chris Farley and El Nino, uh, you know, definitely do that because it's, it's hysterical. But the point of showing this is simply that 97-98 made a really big dent in the public's mindset. And uh, it's important to remember that even though we got this one six months in advance, part of that was because it was an exceptional event, and we really saw it coming well in advance. But arguably, um, a lot of other El Nino events do not play out in the same way. And so here's an example just from last year. All right, So this is the model suite of forecasts made in early September 2012. And it's showing um, each line is basically a forecast for that Nino 3.4 region versus P's. And roughly anything above this pink dash line right in here is what we consider El Nino. So in early September 2012, most models were actually putting us into an El Nino event. Um, and what, what happened here? Well, here's a, a kind of superimposed the observed bullet point for DJF of 2012-13. Um, uh, and as you can see, that uh, what we actually observed is well outside that envelope. We were This is just one data set, but we're in kind of cool, neutral conditions. The ocean is actually... Uh, much more vigorously uh, La Nina-like than the atmosphere, which has not been responding in a, in a stationary way. So we do consider it neutral because we consider both the ocean and the atmosphere. But this is just an illustration of what can happen um, in association with predictions of these events. We do a lot better when we're in the event than we do at forecasting the event itself. And here's where we are with the observations. And you see we were very warm. Uh, going into that El Nino territory. This is actually superimposed against historical um, evolutions, and you can see how exceptional this event was and, and just kind of dropping off and decaying. And why did this happen? Well, we really, you know, while we have a few ideas, we don't know why this happened. So what are some primary features of ENSO model performance? Well, if you look at the most recent article um, on El Nino, um, model evaluation in BAMS um, by Tony Barnston and all, we in the last decade have noticed that dynamical models on, run on supercomputers have just slightly, barely, but statistically significantly edged the statistical models and forecast skills. Uh, models continue to have problems with timing, exactly what month will transit, and also the amplitude of ENSO events. And transitions to stronger ENSO events primarily because we can see them coming further in advance, tend to be better predicted um, than transitions to weaker ones. And we still struggle with here the spring prediction barrier, which basically means prediction made right about now um, and, and during the Northern Hemisphere spring tend to have low skill. So here is, um, a, a, this is a plot of the Nino 3.4. And so uh, we're verifying the model with the observed Nino 3.4, and we're showing anomaly correlation as a measure of scale from the ENSIP climate forecast system for this period. All right? and, and keep in mind, there was uh, one version upgrade. And I should also mention that statistical corrections were applied to the, the model data after 2009. So there's still there's adjustment going on here. But ultimately, if you see these anomaly correlations, and this is the target for the season you're trying to predict. Um, the lead time, uh, zero to eight months. And you can see that, you know, and then if you're trying to predict Northern Hemisphere winter um, after roughly about June, you do a pretty good job. The anomaly correlation is about 0.8 to 0.9. But if you're trying to predict the target through the spring barrier in here, you're going to have a, an awfully tough time of it. And part of the reason why the spring barrier exists is, quite frankly, that is a time of year when there's a lot of transition in ENSO. You know, the peaks in the winter often decays during the spring, or maybe you'll get an emergent El Nino or La Nina event. And so there's a very transitional time of year, and models have trouble with it. Root mean squared errors are actually quite large. Keep in mind, our thresholds are roughly about 0.5 degrees C, plus or minus, for an El Nino or La Nina. And root mean squared error is <laughs> roughly about 0.5 to 1 degree C. So keep in mind when you're looking at ensemble mean that um, the actual observed variability will actually be considerably uh, different. So here is the same sort of plot that this uh, top left 
um, second one from the right on the first row there, is the NCEP CFS. Um, this is what you've already seen here. And this is showing a whole suite of other models. Dynamical models are shown here. And uh, the statistical models are shown in this, this, this orange box. And one of the biggest features that jumps off the page is that these strong spring barrier um, in the statistical models. And so we find that dynamical models do better than the statistical models uh, uh, in that particular zone, the spring barrier. It tends to be somewhat smaller um, and more compact in the dynamical models. And part of that is simply because dynamical models have better initial conditions. And so they're able to uh, basically sense the evolution and transitions in the systems on shorter time scales than statistical models. Statistical models are often on monthly or average of seasonal data. And so they're almost at an intrinsic disadvantage because they're not seeing the actual uh, you know, uh, real-time evolution. So there can be quite a delay. And so I think that hinders them in the spring barrier. Uh, for northern hemisphere winter targets, the statistical and dynamical models are more comparable. So this is a fairly busy plot, but ultimately um, what it's showing is it's showing a, a running correlation for a, a three-year window. And what it shows is that the correlations tend in the scale of these models tends to be very high during certain intervals, like say in the, the 80s here, we have fairly high correlations, and then it really tanked here in the, in the mid-90s, and then it got better here in the late 90s, and, and in, basically in the last decade, we've seen a period of fairly low skill for these models. And it's not that, you know, the, the, the modelers are, are taking a field trip in these intervals or anything like that, but simply that the natural variability of ENSO is such that um, it can affect model performance. So if you're sitting there tinkering the model with the model, you have to realize that your improvements might actually not emerge outside of this natural variability of El Nino and La Nina. So um, keep that in mind. So there's really, in, in my opinion, um, about two really uh, popular areas of ENSO investigation, at least looking at the research community and what, what they're investigating currently. One is that there's a huge drive now to understand these different types or flavors of El Nino and La Nina. And the, the potential operational linkage, in order if you understand these different types more, is that you potentially can better understand and predict ENSO strength. And you can also, because of that, um, strength, strength is related to the impact of the US, you can also gain a better appreciation for impact. And then the other area is this role of mid-latitude variability on ENSO. All right, so ENSO, El Nino, La Nina, certainly impacts the, the, the higher latitudes in the United States. But this is the kind of the reverse problem, is how the mid-latitude variability will impact El Nino and La Nina. And there's it's an interesting work here that basically it seems to imply that you could um, have some skill at predicting ENSO one year in advance. So as I said, there's a, really, um, you know, the 97-98 event which is right here, um, was a, a sort of, of this flavor of El Nino. Uh, we call these uh, Eastern Pacific events. They also go by other names, cold tongue El Nino or conventional or canonical El Ninos. And so this very big event really fit into this canonical cap, uh, category. And so did some of the other larger events in the 80s and 90s. But recently, I think there's been an increased appreciation for this other type of El Nino, uh, which is generally weaker and has more of a central Pacific uh, signal. So above average temperatures tends to be more confined to the central Pacific. Um, this is a EOS method, so it, it actually creates these below average STTs here, but that's not as critical. The point is, is that the warmth tends to be more retracted back toward the west. These are all called Central Pacific or Warm Pool El Ninos. And here's one of our bigger El Ninos, most recently 2009 and 10. And if you look at what the, the actual real uh, you know, sea surface temperatures anomalies look like, they look like this. Um, so they don't have that, that full eastward extension. It's actually retracted back a little bit over the Central Pacific. Um, and this can be important. And the problem is we actually have a hard time ascertaining uh, 
why, <laughs> how important it is because our observational record is fairly short. Our SST records, the reliable, quote unquote, and reliable part goes back probably about 60 years. And within that, you know, maybe, you know, 15 to 20 uh, El Nino events in that period. So when you start reducing the data and start having it, you start losing statistical significance. And so we have a hard time actually looking at the observational data and, and seeing, you know, what sort of impact you know, uh, are different between Eastern and Central Pacific events. But um, here is a study by King C. Mo uh, where she was looking at CMIP3 model runs. And so she had a huge suite of models to look at. And the nice thing about doing that is you really increase your sample size and um, you can sit, start saying something about the model depiction of, El of Eastern versus Central Pacific. But of course, it is susceptible to model error. And so Eastern Pacific event has a stronger uh, eastward extension. And as such, the flow pattern of the US tends to be more uh, zonal. And you have this almost north-south dipole in temperature anomalies. Same with precip. Precip tends to be drier across the northern tier of the United States during an El Nino and wetter across the southern tier. And the Central Pacific event, because the warmth is retracted back toward the west, um, we tend to have the, the wave train, at least in this model, shifted back as well. And so that sets up a different pattern over the United States. This could be critical for, for seasonal climate prediction because if you're seeing an event that has this sort of uh, extent, your impacts may be fairly different from when you're seeing an event that has a central Pacific signal. So we need to better understand these different types of ENSO. The role of mid-latitude variability on ENSO, this has recently gone by this term called the Seasonal Footprinting Mechanism, or SFM. And this is showing December through February in the top row. And the idea is that a very strong uh, uh, pressure anomaly over the North Pacific can imprint itself on the sea surface temperature because you're changing the wind, and essentially you're changing the fluxes um, in and out of the ocean, you can start putting down what they call a footprint of sea surface temperature anomalies across the North Pacific. And what seems to happen is that this footprint has some staying power. It can persist going into March through May, and then the bottom row showing June through August. And so you can still see semblances of this footprint put, put together by this massive wintertime uh, uh, anomaly. And so by having these sea surface temperature anomalies in the subtropics, you can start modifying the wind fields. And when you start modifying the wind fields, particularly along the equator, you can uh, essentially affect the evolution of El Nino and La Nina. And here's a recent study by a collaborator of mine, Simon Wang, at Utah State. And he was also looking at these seasonal footprint ideas. And he actually found this area in the Western Pacific. So this is right at the equator. So now we're focusing, you know, this is Indonesia, Asia, back here. And he noticed the sea surface temperature kind of dipole um, here. And as you can see, they're associated with winds in the Western Pacific. And the minute you start seeing winds near the equator, particularly in the Western Pacific, this is uh, potentially a trigger or inhibitor of El Nino La Nina events. And so when you take an index, a time series of this box off Taiwan, or a time series of this particular uh, uh, statistical technique procedure in MCA, what you'll notice is that it's actually very well correlated, significantly so, with El Nino and La Nina's the following winter. So this is one year in advance predicting roughly about 36% of variance. But I should warn you, this is using dependent data. So um, there certainly needs to be more work done here, um, cross-validation, to figure out how this will work in real time. So has ENSO been solved? Hopefully, uh, now you can understand that there's actually quite a lot to investigate here. I only touched two areas. I could probably go through a couple more, but I don't have time. <laughs> So how do we move forward? One, we need to learn how to distinguish between these different El Nino flavors. Uh, the Eastern Pacific events uh, tend to be forecasted better. Central Pacific events were pretty bad at those. Uh, we also need to better understand the seasonal footprinting mechanism. And I haven't, I haven't talked about this, but we need to continue to update our model physics. In particular, cloud convection um, is really presenting problems in terms of resolving the, the correct frequency, and also the type of ENSO is, is sensitive to this. 
we need to produce ensembles and long read forecasts and, and associate you with that. If we're getting a large uh, model data set into pass, we're able to create statistical, uh, statistical procedures in order to correct for these model biases, which will always exist. I mean, we'll never have a perfect model. So uh, it makes sense for us to be running these long hind halves in order to correct for them and also help us generate probabilities. Uh, we need improved ocean observations for the best initial conditions possible. Um, we need to include the subsurface oceans. Uh, ocean currents need to be included. Uh, over the last year, the Tau buoy array has really suffered some really large shortages in the eastern Pacific, which um, has a, you know, presented some issue for uh, resolving what we're seeing. And then finally, I would argue that we need to improve these historical SST data sets um, particularly if we want to understand in the observational record the difference between Central Pacific and Eastern Pacific events, we need a longer record. We need to develop those data sets much more. So um, now I'm transitioning into the kind of the MJO section and um, just to, to kind of uh, set the stage here, 97, 98, all right, so that event that was pretty well predicted six months in advance, well, you know, the strength of that event really was not predicted. I mean, it was only when we were in the event and it already emerged that we understood that it's going to be a strong event. But the prediction itself ahead of time was actually fairly lousy. And what we noticed um, in, in, in runs in later years, and this is one paper, but there are others, is that the members that had uh, more MJO progression uh, further east uh, tended to do better at getting the ultimate amplitude of that strong event than ones that stayed further back to the west. So what is the Madden Julian oscillation? Uh, it is subseasonal. So we were talking mainly with N, so we're talking about monthly and seasonal averages. Here we're talking about weekly. Now we're getting down almost to the daily resolution. So we're getting closer to these quote unquote weather time scales. And what it is is a pattern that moves eastward around the entire global tropics in about 30 to 60 days. All right. And the strongest appearance. You can see this in unfiltered data. You don't have to filter the data. Unfiltered data, you can see it winds, rainfalls over the Indian and Pacific Ocean. And it's moving slower at that point. But it can also affect the Western Hemisphere. It speeds up and loses some of its character. But um, it certainly goes around the entire global tropics. And it exists about 40 to 50 percent of the time. It can go many seasons that MGO, but it, it is around quite a bit. This is an index called the Wheeler and Hendon MJO index that helps us track the position of the MJO. And it exists when this index starts moving in this counterclockwise fashion. Each point is a day, a single day, and where um, there's some labels here, Maritime Continent and Western Pacific, that show where the enhanced rainfall is located. And so here are some composites. So we're basically taking all those different phases and we're averaging the rainfall. And right away, what you should see is these greens from top to bottom, um, you know, shifting eastward. All right, so this is the movement, eastern movement of the MGO as you go from top to bottom. And it's a dipole. So not only do you have these enhanced rainfall anomalies, you also have suppressed rainfall right now anomalies coming up behind it. And so here's our index again. And basically, you can use these composites to essentially ascertain where the MJ is located. So uh, for February 12th to 14th, we were in this zone, which is phase two. So if you were to look at the actual observed data, it would have looked a lot like this pattern. That is enhanced rainfall over the Indian Ocean and suppressed over the maritime continent. And that progresses eastward. And this is actually really exciting work by a collaborator of mine, um, Emily Riddle. Um, it appeared in the Climate Dynamics April, um, just this month, uh, 2013. And what she noticed is that there's certain wintertime patterns uh, that occur more frequently with the MGO. And I'm not going to tell you how she found these, but ultimately she got a pattern that looks a lot like the negative Arctic Oscillation or negative NAO. And so uh, what she noticed is that the MJO, when it's in certain phases, tends to favor the occurrence of this pattern. And so this is showing a segment here, but this is MJO phase six, phase seven, phase eight at the bottom. And what it's showing is anything that's a positive bar means that this pattern is more frequent. 
And if it's red, that means it's statistically significantly more frequent. If it's 100, that means it's occurring twice as common as climatology. And so if you're in MGO phase 6 and you're here at day 0, then maybe you can expect the occurrence of this pattern occurring about, mm, about 18 to 30 days after MGO phase 6, right? As you get, as it goes into MGO phase seven, uh, this, pro this pattern starts occurring about seven to, you know, 20 days, um, you know, uh, after MGO phase seven. Once you're in MGO phase eight, you're kind of in the thick of things. Um, and so clearly, you know, probability favors this pattern with the MGO. This slant is evidence of that eastward moving si signal. And so she found three of these patterns. This is what you saw in the previous slide was just one of them. You saw this phase six, seven, and eight um, in, in association pattern. But there's others. There's two other patterns she found commonly associated with MJO. This is daily data, daily. And so she noticed that this kind of positive PNA light pattern also occurs roughly in phase seven, six, um, phase six, seven, and eight. And it actually occurs somewhat right before the negative AO light pattern. So this Cluster B positive PNA pattern is occurring somewhat before the negative AO pattern. And then cluster C, this negative PNA pattern, look at this, um, is occurring actually in the opposite state. It's when the MJOs in phase uh, relate into like 2, 3, 4, and 5. And there are temperature impacts associated with these height anomalies. Uh, here's our negative AO pattern. Here's our positive PNA pattern. This is our negative PNA pattern. We also have composites. And what I'm trying to reinforce here is on each phase, and unfortunately, I don't like the composites because uh, MGO is moving, so there's these lag relationships, and the composites are just getting the instantaneous relationship. Um, so it gives you some idea, but I actually like Emily's methods best. And so ultimately, um, you can see there's a flip between having warmth and cool conditions over the US. And those are on our website if you want to look at them further. So how good is the prediction scale of the MJO? Well, there's Wheeler and Hems and Penn and MJO index. Is scale is found out to about two weeks for nearly all models. Um, the ECMWS has scale of about 0.5 out to a month. Uh, the correlation uh, for CFS version 2 is here, uh, about 20 days. And here's GEFS. <laughs> this is a small period, 2008 to 2012, but you can see GFS is is kind of behind the pack. So right here, this orange one, that's the operational GFS. So um, if we are seeing these uh, MJO relationships at long lags, I mean, we're talking 20, 30 days here, and our, our models, you know, don't seem to resolve the MJO index as well. So we need to look into that. Uh, here's the ECMWS model, which is uh, uh, what they've noticed in this particular paper is that the skill of temperature over the northern hemisphere for days 19 to 25 tends to be much more reliable, right along here, this black line, than when there is no MJO occurring. Then it's almost flat line and very unreliable. So where do we have room to improve? Much like ENSO, we need to work on the clouds and moisture and convective processes. We need to work on physics of the model. And uh, Christina Stan and all basically show that if you use the super parameterized model, you get a better MJO, which is evidence that the clouds are really important to get right. Super parameterized models tend to do better with the clouds. We also need to continue studies on how the MJO impacts the U.S. I just gave you a sample, but it's actually quite hard to statistically extract signal from the noise. And so we need to better understand how the MJO is impacting the U.S. It leads to these benefits listed here. We would potentially, a better MJO is going to give us better probabilistic outlooks for weeks one, four. But keep in mind, we have to have ensemble predictions. We have to have many members. It's not enough to get the MJO right. So even if you have the perfect MJO in your model, you're still at, you know, for weeks two through four, you still need uh, you know, ensembles in order to give you your spread and your probabilities associated with the MJO. Um, again, I, I would argue that you get better attribution capability. So why is it so cold outside? Well, potentially, it's the MJO forcing this. And here's a case study, and this is the last chunk of slides, and I'm sorry, I'm now at 3.32, but I promise I'll wrap this up in a couple minutes. 
Um, this is January through March. I, I'm intentionally picking a very recent period. There's probably other periods that are better examples of this, but um, this is a decent one. Uh, in January through March, uh, I was in zone neutral, all right, and there was a sudden stratospheric warming in place, and there was conveniently and very active Nat and Julian oscillation. And this oscillation, this is just in the January and March 2013 period, went through this zone. Remember six, seven, and eight? Because that was associated with that negative AO light pattern. Went through the zone twice. Went through it in the last half of January and last half of March, almost, you know, perfectly in days. And, and the MGO went into these other opposite phases here during the last half of February. Okay, so there, here's our pattern that's associated with that negative AO seemed to occur uh, fairly frequently with the MGO. But this pattern also occurs in association with sudden stratospheric warming. And here is um, essentially a vertical cross section. So this is the top of the atmosphere all the way down to the surface. The tropopause is somewhere around here. So this is the troposphere where we live down here. And ultimately, right around January 1st of this year, we saw a very strong strat sudden stratospheric warming, and that has propagated down to the surface, extending all the way through arguably March. But one thing I want to emphasize here is that you might see this pattern associated with sudden stratospheric warming on, say, a 30 or 60-day average. But as you can see in the troposphere, the variability is much more pronounced. All right, see all the fluctuation in the height anomalies? This is height anomalies just over the polar cap, so these reds associated with this pattern. Anyway, so there's a lot of fluctuation near the surface here. And what I was noticing when I was putting together this talk a couple weeks ago is that, is that these extensions, these red extensions down to the surface, actually occurred predominantly in two periods, right here in late January and right here in late March. This is our most recent cold air outbreak. We lost spring. <laughs> anyway, but uh, these two periods are interesting because it coincided when the MGO-related convection was following phases seven and eight. Um, the dash green area right here is when the polar the, the geopotential height over the polar cap was actually weaker than average, and that is when the MGO is passing into a phase that does not favor uh, above average geopotential heights. I'm going to skip this and go right to temperature. So this is the expected MGO force pattern after phases seven and eight. And this is averaging daily data uh, of temperature. I'm using GDAS. And I did this on March 28th, which is why it stops at March 27th. But anyway, the two-week periods following the MGO in phase seven, you can see this uh, northwest to southeast tilt in the below average anomalies over the United States. And that matches up fairly well with the expected pattern after um, phases seven and eight. And so uh, arguably, I say those are MGO force. Here's the rest of the period. So the first half of January and the first half of March. You certainly got cold in here, particularly in the first half of March, but it did not have the configuration uh, that, that uh, the, er, the later period of March had. And in February, it was kind of a wash bag. If you look at the whole JFM period as a whole, um, largely over the US, it was, it was predominantly average. So here's where you can get more information on the MGO, and uh, I did it within five minutes. <laughs> um, and uh, if you have any questions, um, certainly feel free to ask them now, and you can also email me. I know I tend to be a type of person who watches a talk and thinks of a great question about an hour later, and <laughs> always regret not asking it, so feel free to email me. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, excellent. Uh, overview, uh, very enlightening and, uh, and uh, provoking, thought-provoking. So let's see if we have some questions from anyone on the line, first of all. Uh, if you please raise your hand if you have a question, and we will unmute you. Do you have anybody yet? All right, we got Matt Solom. Oh, and we have Dave Novak. So we're going to go Matt. Matt? No, we're going, who are we going with? We're going to go with uh, Dave. Dave? Matt has a problem with his connection. All right, Matt may have a problem. Dave Novak, go ahead. You are unmuted, Dave. Dave? <laughs> you need to unmute your phone. <laughs> 
Can he type his message into the box? Yes, he could do that. Hey, Dave, type your message into the box. <laughs> or you can ask me when you see me at work tomorrow. <laughs> so, well, while, while, while we're... Uh, okay, Matt, Matt seems to be able to talk. Let's, uh, there we go. Matt, go ahead. Okay, um, this is, uh, actually this is Jeff, uh, we're on Matt's, uh, Matt, Matt's name popped up here, but this is Jeff uh, Lorenz at Western Region Headquarters. A question about, I think it was uh, slide 14 where you had sort of a time series of the uh, El Nino and, and La Nina events. So the question is, Michelle, have you seen any relationship between the strength and the duration of El Nino and or La Nina events at all? Or is there no relationship at all? Um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it, it, it can be a somewhat tough question to ask, just like I said, because of our sample size of our record. Um, it, in other words, it doesn't leap out at us. Um, what I will say is that uh, duration tends to be pegged uh, more to um, what phase you're in. In other words, La Nina events uh, tend to have a much more longer staying power than El Nino events. So La Nina events can last a year. Um, in, in, in particular, like just I would say in the last five years, we seem to have this reoccurrence of La Nina patterns in the winter. So even if it returns to neutral in the summer, we tend to have these what we call double dip phenomena, where we go right back into La Nina next winter. So there's some there's some persistence associated with La Nina. It, it, there's a couple papers on it re recently um, that indicate that the configuration of La Nina is such that it, it does have more persistence. Okay, uh, who else do we have? Dave has a typed his in and he wants to know, is there a difference in thermocline depth between the EP and the CP El Nino event? That's a really good question. Um, for folks that don't know, the thermocline is uh, an area of, of really a strong change in temperature um, in the subsurface ocean. So this is looking below the surface of the ocean where temperatures change the most. So closer to the surface tends to be warmer at depth, it tends to be cold, and thermocline kind of separates both of those things. And so this is a good question because um, the thermocline tends to be more, on average, shallower in the eastern Pacific. And so during eastern Pacific events, the thermocline in the eastern Pacific um, tends to become very uh, deep. And so that is the warmth in the eastern Pacific uh, is extends further below the surface. And so the thermocline is, is, is fully engaged in the eastern Pacific during eastern Pacific El Nino events. Um, the central Pacific is actually uh, very much not uh, driven by that eastern Pacific thermocline. So what we've noticed with central Pacific events is that they are driven more by the zonal um, kind of currents and zonal advection in the in the, the western and central Pacific. And so th there is some thermocline contribution, but it's, it's much smaller than the eastern Pacific. And central Pacific events tend to be driven more by the local winds and also sea surface temperature gradients. And as, as such, because of that, that's why they think central Pacific events tend to be weaker, is that they don't have that full engagement by the thermocline. Uh, I have a question. Do do you, uh, aside from sea surface temperatures, are, are people looking at like biological response and, and fishing uh, as a I don't know leading indicator as well of of uh, you know, oncoming uh, ENSO events? Um, well, yeah. I mean, arguably the El Nino phenomenon was discovered by fishermen, so it was the biological response that actually kind of enabled us to figure out that this was even a player, you know, in Peru and hundreds of years ago, um, fishermen noticed this phenomenon. Um, it's not a leading indicator. Um, it tends to be, uh, you know, uh, more after an ENSO is formed uh, during, during the northern hemisphere winter, uh, southern hemisphere summer is when uh, you tend to see the biggest impact, especially in the eastern Pacific on um, fisheries. And then there's, of course, um, people are now studying a North Pacific response on fisheries off the West Coast. And certainly, uh, you know, th that tends to be a little bit less significant. But when you put in a big North Pacific atmosphere circulation,
population anomaly, you can affect the amount and degree of upwelling on the West Coast. And so as a result of that, there is some linkage between the amount of uh, food, essentially, fish can feed on uh, because of the state of El Nino on you. But it's, it's more of a lag response. Question in the room. Uh, let's Dennis first. Yeah, I have two questions. One was about, I think it was the slide six, uh, where you showed it on the bottom, you showed it on the bottom. Can you go to slide six? Sure. I believe I did. <laughs> there we go. Well, I'm not sure if it was slide six or five. Back one. Back one. Yeah, back one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this slide, um, in these plumes, are they showing both? Maybe I'm not interpreting this right. I see a positive anomaly and a negative anomaly among different um, plumes at the same time. Yeah, um, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, all right, so I, I definitely did not uh, spend the time describing this, so certainly um, let's go through it. So what this plot is showing is an uh, individual model. Uh, each line is a different model, and, and they're listed there in the legend on the right. And showing a prediction for the Nino 3.4 region, um, this, this particular plume is initialized in January of 2012 and it's going out to, of course, O&D. And so each model um, is, is essentially predicting a different value of Nino 3.4. And spread is actually fairly considerable. And this is normal. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to emphasize here is that these models are ensemble means. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're actually not seeing the quote, unquote, full spread associated with each model. Some of these models have a number of members um, associated with them. And so the spread, if you were to actually look at that plume, would be much greater. So here you're evaluating almost intermodal differences as opposed to you know, uh, the, the, uh, the initial condition differences. But one might look at that and say, well, how do you know anything? The spread shows such a variability between warm and cold. How would you know that there's going to be an El Nino or a La Nina? Yeah, welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, this this is uh, this can be a, looking at plots like these can be a considerable challenge, and that's why it's really important for us to emphasize on seasonal time scales the probabilistic nature of prediction. And I almost feel like folks in the community start cringing the minute I start bringing up probability. Um, and but it's a necessity. That is, the outcomes, the spread is so deep here that you have to. Like, in other words, there's always going to be some percent chance that you're going to be below that black line. And so that's why we thought it was important, if you go back to that, that bar plot slide. Oh, board. Um, you know, to start expressing our forecast like this. And if you go to our monthly ENSO diagnostic discussion, um, you do get like a synopsis statement, like uh, ENSO neutral is expected in the coming, you know, a uh, couple seasons, um, and that's only expressed because there's such an overwhelming probability in this case for ENSO neutral. But it's important to remember, even at the shortest lead, there's what nine percent chance of La Nina. So we're not ruling out that even at lead zero that we could go back into a La Nina, and so part of the challenge, particularly at Climate Prediction Center, and my job is offer this sort of information, but at the same time, describe it in a way that hopefully the community can, can grab onto. And, it, and it's, it's hard. It's not, I, I don't pretend we have this down. But the, the key, key thing to emphasize here is that climate, subseasonal, seasonal, is inherently probabilistic. Uh, you, you, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you mentioned the dynamic method is a slightly aged statistical uh, method. So, because normally a uh, statistical method is just 1% uh, use very little resource compared with the uh, dynamic method. So, yeah. do you think that if we slightly increase the invest in the statistical method, maybe we can... Yeah. No, that uh, young fan just asked that wonderful question. And that's actually, um, if you go to Tony Barnes's paper, he sort of makes a point about this. It's, 
is that simply we have invested over the last decade such a huge amount into our you know, big supercomputer um, climate models. And as such, we're now starting to see the fruits of that. But they're just, at least in the spring, only barely exceeding what you can run on your laptop. I mean, now empirical models, they also have a second drawback in that we are seeing trends in the Pacific Ocean. And we're seeing tendencies that might not be statistically significant at this point, but we can't rule out they would be more so in the future. Um, if your past is, you know, much different from your current and your future, then the empirical models will have some, you know, drawbacks there. So, um, you know, potentially you do need to kind of uh, keep that in mind when you're using that very nice model that you can run on your laptop is that it's based on historical relationships, not based on future relationships. So as such, dynamical models could potentially do better when the future changes in a way that's not consistent with Professor, the second question is, uh, you showed the one map, uh, strong uh, spin barrier. The third map one is uh, uh, GFS, mm -hmm. that uh, on the GFS model. Yeah. All right, sorry, what was your question? The, the very yeah, me... strong uh, spin barrier forecast. I know, I just had to put it yeah. just barley. All right. So, yeah, this is, so based so on is uh, GFS. Yeah. Because uh, some other models says they uh, have weak spin barrier. Right. Yeah. So let's, let's look at yeah. Energy. Yeah. I didn't have enough time to go into this, but there's a lot of interesting information here. So, um, uh, so this is CFS, and I I would actually argue CFS is one of the better dynamical models um, for ENSO. Um, JMA right here is pretty good. Um, I should mention that these big blocks, the, the dark gray, just means that there wasn't enough. Uh, predictions in this time span. So if we had less than 50% of the predictions, we just we just didn't look at them. So JMA, from what we can see, is also a pretty good model. Uh, ECMWF is right here. And as you can see, you can kind of start seeing spring barrier. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the full suite to really evaluate it. But it seems that they have some edge in that particular season. Uh, getting to the, uh, I mean, the, the 97 El Nino, the Chris Farley uh, El Nino. So, so uh, that was that was. A, uh, I remember that, and and you know there was a huge um, uh, effort to to socialize that. We were right, and the, everybody responded. You know, and, and it was a big success. But but now you you presented today. You know, it's not just and so you've got the Man Julian, you've got other things going on. So. So um, one question is, back in that um, in the '97 event, what was going on with Man Julian? Did uh, was it was it uh, uh, you know particularly? So so when I think of like you know synoptic meteorology, we look at like Louis examining some uh, extratropical event. You say, okay, well th we had a superstorm because this lined up and this lined up and this lined up, and we got a superstorm. So now this suggests a similar type of thing for these seasonal patterns that. If the El, you got an El Nino or a La Nina, or whatever, and you got the Van Julian in the right place, and you got the Arctic Oscillation in the right place, you're going to have this huge local response in the next month or so. Is that is that where this is going? Um, well, I mean, certainly, uh, yeah. What you what you said makes sense. That if you have uh, a bunch of climate patterns constructively interfering, mm -hmm. then you're going to have essentially a juiced up pattern. And I would argue we saw that in January, February, and March with the MJO and the sudden stratosphere forming. We saw some really pronounced, impressive cold air outbreaks. In part, I would argue, unfortunately, it is somewhat hand wavy because you just saw that analysis on that slide. But I would look at the riddle and all paper, too. Um, but regardless, it was the superposition of those two climate patterns that helped throw um, a lot of cold weather that we saw. And so it's similar when you're talking about onset of El Nino and La Nina is that phasing and placement of the Madre Julian oscillation can have considerable impact on whether that El Nino La Nina event is going to happen. And more than that, because of this particular study, is that it determines essentially the strength of El Nino. So in 97, 98, what we saw 
like in the previous December of 96 going into January 97, really pronounced MJ event going around. And ultimately, it was able to uh, create a cascade of events that pushed more warm water to the east and really was the genesis for the really strong events. The problem is Madden Julian oscillation you can only predict so far in advance, and we're talking about seasonal predictions. So uh, ultimately, you know, I, that's why I think it's really important that, and I think it's a good development, that the community is starting to really emphasize multi-model ensembles and, and re-forecast, because in a, when minute you take all your members and average them out in a seasonal forecast model, you're essentially averaging out the MJO. You're, you're going to reduce how much MJO you have. So you've now eliminated some important information. So arguably in 9798, if you saw a bunch of your members progressing into the zone, which would enhance the amplitude of the event, you might say, hey, there's a probability this is going to be a pretty strong event. And it was the superposition of this forming El Nino and the not Julian oscillation that helped drive it into that exceptional territory. But there's, that's almost the random noise. I mean, I know whether folks hate it when I say <laughs> noise when I refer to synoptic systems. But ultimately, uh, there's always going to be some element of this that is, that is noisy, and we have to take that into account when we're making these sort of predictions. Bob, you have a question? Question? Yeah. Um, I've got some. Go back to your uh, spread diagram. The, the what? The, uh, the ensemble diagram way back. Oh, oh back. Previous. Yeah, that. Uh, I understand why you've got the means plot. It's just how you couldn't possibly plot it. You couldn't possibly plot all the members. You just have a, right. a black thing. I guess my question is, when you've got that, and you want to look at the end, and you want to get a probability out of it, and so forth. Uh, what do you kind of do? Get a normal distribution or something to these things, and you get probabilities out of that, or you just look at them, or what do you do? Um, it's a really good question. Um, right now, we consider, when we sit down, each forecaster is writing down the probability. But there's two primary pieces of information that we have at our fingertips in order to help us construct the probability. Well, actually, there's three. Three. The first piece is what's climatologically, what is the chance of this only year one? So that's the first piece we consider. So we have probability of each bin going out eight seasons climatologically. Then we have um, this uh, plume information. So essentially, the plume probabilities are determined by fitting a Gaussian distribution at each leaf. And there is some skill weighting. So in other words, uh, Tony, I'm not exactly sure how you determine skill weighting, but he is, you know, assigning lesser skill at longer leads. And, Simon and Mason involved in that? What? Excuse me, Simon Mason involved in that? He's in the same agency, but he's not, he's he's not, not actually in part of this ENSO team, but certainly they're exchanging information. Um, but ultimately, they're sitting in a Gaussian distribution, we get probabilities from that. There's a third technique that we also consider, and that's created by Dave Ongo, uh, who is uh, it's called a, you know, essentially ensemble regression. Um, and it's not done on the plume data, but some models that we have internal at CPC. Um, the CFS and several statistical models, he applies this ensemble regression to them, and we get another set of probabilities associated with that. I guess it would seem like to me that if you're actually fitting the normal distribution to that, if you if you fit it to the members, you you would certainly get more spread, yeah. and therefore get a, a more spread of yeah. things rather than looking at the mean. No, you're you're absolutely right. So um, you know the point being is that the actual spread in reality is probably much greater than this. Is absolutely correct. Um, the, the the downside, unfortunately, is that. I mean, this particular plume is popular because of how many models are on it. And unfortunately, all those models do not supply their ensemble members. So we, we obviously internally have CFS version 2 members, and we, we can get the members from other models as 
well, but largely they just give Tony the ensemble meat. So, um, you know, there's other plumes that you can construct with just the, the models that have the ensemble members, and those are starting to be generated, but then you reduce the number of models that you have on them. So there's some trade-off, I guess. What, what did you mean by um, super parameterized? Um, that's a really good question, too. Um, super parameterized, can we go back? So super parameterized came up in this slide. Oh, way too many animations. Look how many times I'm pushing up. Okay. Uh, what are, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so, so, so this came up because we were talking to NGO, and I noted that superparameterized model tends to have a better yeast sort propagating MJO than the standard uh, model. And so arguably because superparameterized model has it, um, this puts, puts the fingerprint on, on class. Now, superparameterized, I guess, is just this term for what's called a, uh, a, a cloud-resolving model. I can't remember, it's CRM or something like that. And so a normal uh, GCM is like a single grid box is like you know hundreds of kilometers by hundreds of kilometers in the horizontal, like 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers. And clouds, of course, are occurring within a kilometer. So there's a scaling issue there. Um, and obviously, you could run a, a GCM uh, at a kilometer by a kilometer, but it might be 100 years from now. <laughs> So um, in order to get around that, uh, modelers create parameterizations, which help them resolve what is within the grid box. And it's, they're essentially you know, uh, ideas of how uh, you know, the physics work within that grid box. And the super parameterized uh, is a scheme where essentially they're fitting some kind of two-dimensional, I've had this described to me, and I don't understand all the details, but essentially it's two-dimensional uh, uh, plane within the grid box that effectively uh, it, it is almost an ensemble of clouds. So it's a, it's, 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 a, 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 it's a less expensive way of running a computer model and resolving clouds um, than you know having a, a really super juiced up CCM. Um, and it's 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 expensive. So one of the reasons we probably can't adapt this right now is that we don't have quite enough computing to do it. But um, ultimately, we're getting closer and closer, and so we need to start investigating these different ways to resolve clouds in order to get it and get the MJO right. OK. We're at the top of the hour, so we'll, we'll have to say, save it for uh, uh, offline, please. Uh, so I want to, again, uh, thank uh, Michelle for a very enlightening talk. Um, we hope to have her back or some other colleagues from CPC. This, let's not make this just a one person only. Uh, thank Tim McClung for arranging this. And uh, so everyone, um, please, uh, if you have further questions, uh, please email Michelle. She put her email, and this whole PowerPoint presentation with all the links and all the animations is uploaded on the RIPFORM website, so you can download it and share it with your friends and colleagues, uh, and uh, as well as a recording of, um, of the actual audio as well. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you in May.